artifact day guys I'm gonna explain some of these uh, weapons of the hunt um, these are artifacts that were found in Connecticut and it shows the type of stone that was used and it wasn't the best of stuff it's around 9,500 years old this is a, a later point a woodland point called the Lavana as well as some flake tools, hide scrapers, and other tools used for not only hunting, but also processing the game. And I just wanted to go over some things in this video with you. The game back in the Ice Age, the animals were very, very large, like this mastodon here, depicted in a snowy scene. This thing is huge if you stand next to it. Amazing creature. Then there's also the modern beaver in comparison to the Ice Age beaver. You could see the skull size difference. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Everything was bigger back then. And you can't tell how big this guy is. I'm just going to stick my hand in his eye and you'll be able to maybe tell a little bit. But this thing is huge, man. Now, there's some scenes here that I want to show. In the aftermath of a successful hunt, members of this ancient hunting group have begun to butcher the fallen caribou. Like native people in more recent times, the paleo hunters were probably accustomed to making the fullest possible use of the caribou as a source of food. Now, one of the things about caribou is people who used to eat caribou, they wanted the organs, they wanted the marrow from the bones and the fat from the animal maybe even the brains. There's a lot of fat in a bowl that's highly desired. And fat in the ribs, fat, potassium, and sodium in the tongue. And it made the tongue a delicacy, really. But the meat itself is pretty lean. And certain times of the year, you could have either a lean caribou or a fat caribou. <laughs> a large caribou carrying all of its winter fat might feed a small group of hunters for several days. But its soft, warm hide could last much longer if properly tanned and softened. This labor-intensive process would have begun when the animal's hide was stripped from the carcass and then scraped clean of the flesh on its underside. The skin from which all the tissue and meat have been scraped off was, was dried for one day or, or two days um, a freezer of brains and water and wrung out and then it was stretched and soaked again, stretched and soaked again. And basically this process was uh, repeated two or three times until finally uh, you had a skin that was, that was quite soft. A finished hide with its hair scraped off might have been sewn into a tent cover or cut into small pieces for various other uses. With its hair left on, the caribou skin would have provided excellent material for bedding or for the kind of winter clothing worn by the hunters in this diorama. A person who was wearing uh, caribou skin clothing with the hair inside could live through winters where the temperatures fell to 50 or 60 degrees below zero with no trouble whatsoever. But if you're in a season where the caribou does not have much fat and it's a very lean caribou, you're going to want other animals to hunt, fatter animals, like possibly that beaver or seal or a walrus, something along those lines. Uh, I wanted to show the, the process of tanning a hide here. They used a mixture of brains and water to soften, soften the skin and to preserve it successful hunt has come to an end, but the people's work is far from over. With razor-sharp stone tools and experienced hands, they will now begin to butcher the fallen caribou. The people will use everything the caribou has to provide. Not only food, but also material for valuable tools. 
And most important is the caribou's thick, soft hide, which the people now begin to prepare for use in clothing and shelter that will keep them warm throughout the long, cold winter ahead. You could see an ancient person here using a little billet on some Norman scale chert to make fluted points and little scraper and flake knives. These flake knives, a lot of people that think it's just throwaway flakes were actually tools. They were used for cutting leather, they were used for cutting skins, especially when you're skinning the animal, those flakes work really well. After those uh, animated hunting scenes here, you could really picture what the museum here is depicting and you could actually see the spears in flight heading towards the caribou with the fluted points hafted onto the shafts. They even went as far to show the blood on a fluted point laying on top of the caribou being um, butchered. And the other guy in the last scene was actually holding a caribou head. I have a friend who um, eats a lot of wild food. And on his YouTube channel, The Wooded Beardsman, uh, he tests a lot of these foods that we don't really do anymore. It's kind of, uh, kind of, kind of gross, but kind of awesome at the same time. Like he'll eat fish yeah, eyeballs. You see, uh, the head possible ancient food sources there's two channels to check out it's the wooded beardsman and also his friend jeremy and his channel name is one wild crafter now you're going to want to check both of those guys out for um traditional foods and wild edibles now i just wanted to give you guys a good depiction of what's going on in this section of the museum here where you can see the caribou hunt. So I'm gonna pan around a little bit and let you look. You could pause on certain scenes to see what's going on. Now this is a different section of the museum, and it's actually a Native American village. So you guys should appreciate seeing this. It really brings um, things to life in this section. Here is a stone knife being used to cut up these very large bass. Those are huge. And here's what appears to be a father teaching their child, or maybe an uncle teaching their nephew, uh, how to haft stone points and how to fletch stone points. And they've got a whole bunch of arrow shafts all tied up and laying down next to them.